All right, it's getting better. Yes, sir. I, I like that. But I was a sergeant. I worked for a living. <clears throat> so by way of introduction, I'd like to talk to you about signs. The Lord gives us signs along the way of our path. And so, some of them signs are, are warning signs. And some of them are direction. There's different kind of signs. So first of all, I think of the first ones I think about is um, driving signs, right? We have signs that tell us to go, right? Green light. We have signs that tell us it's a warning to, uh, to be careful, right? And then we have signs that tell us to stop, right? Everybody know what color that is? Red. And I hope it's not you guys that I see going through the red. All right, so moving along. There's also signs that I call the handwriting on the wall type of signs. Those are the kind of signs that perhaps are indicating it's time for you to change a job. Or perhaps it's time for you to move. There are signs in relationships. Perhaps telling you that this is not God's person for you. And it's time for you to move on. Now let me say, if you're married, this doesn't pertain to you. All right? You're not going to move on. <coughs> So also, there are signs on the highway, and you guys have seen those signs, I'm sure, billboard signs. They're nothing more than a distraction, I believe. And then there are various warning signs in life. Think of weather indications, right? Weather tells us when seasons are going to change in life. Weather signs tell us whether there's a storm approaching. And if you're paying attention, you'll be able to protect yourself and your family. So what do you think will happen if you come to a railroad crossing and you don't pay attention to the sign. All y'all are dead? What, what would happen at a railroad crossing if you don't pay attention? I, I heard a bunch of stuff, but I guess you're saying it won't turn out well for you, right? So, all right. So let me illustrate from personal experience. Recently, my wife and I, <laughs> we went on an adventure. I call it an adventure. And we went kayaking, right, with the intention of going fishing. Now, I did say we were going to try to go fishing, right? Well, <coughs> I wasn't paying attention. I got distracted. And before I knew it, the current just carried us along. And I still wasn't paying attention. And the next thing I knew, we wound up in the bushes. And my wife was laughing because the mangrove branches were hitting her in the face. And we were laughing so hard, we couldn't get out. We had to be rescued. So, but um, more seriously, as I began to look back at that experience, the Holy Spirit began to speak to me, and he started giving me some spiritual insights. And I realized that this is just like real life. The current of life just effortlessly, effortlessly carries you along. We can easily drift off course, and I call it a slow roll, in the wrong direction. Swayed by other things, we start deeming more important. Then suddenly one day you find yourself in a place you never intended to go. Are you playing too close to the edge? Sometimes it happens before we realize what's occurred. We didn't plan it, but there are always consequences. Stay alert. Oh man, you guys, you guys are already gotten killed. Stay alert. Remember that because there's three statements you're going to have to remember by the end of the service. That's one of them. So today's teaching is entitled, Pay Attention to the Signs. Today we're going to talk about some signs that the Holy Spirit may bring your attention to. If you're listening, that would indicate danger of drifting away or having lost your way. Beloved, don't wake up one day finding yourself wondering, how in the world did I get in this mess? Now, go ahead and turn, and I'm not tricking you again, to Hebrews chapter 2. Just put your finger in there, and I'm going to pray. <coughs> hey, Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you again for this opportunity, Lord. I pray, Holy Spirit, you have your way, Lord. I pray that you bring excitement, Lord, to this crowd, Lord, that you stir them in their spirits. Father, that they would be edified, they would be lifted up, they would be encouraged, Lord. And I also pray, Father, as you have shown me, Lord, that some will be challenged, 
Some will be chastised and disciplined with correction in mind because you love them all and you want to draw them back to you. So, Father, I know your word will not go back. It will go out to accomplish what you had it to accomplish, Lord, not come back void. So, Father, have your way. Let them not hear me, Lord, but let them hear you. In Jesus' name, amen. So, let me say this up front. <clears throat> I am freeing you of all the burdens today of having to take notes and having to record and do all these things. You could just sit back and relax because if you want a copy of my notes, at the end of the service, you could come over here and sign up on the clipboard. My wife will help you and I will get back to you, okay? So just relax and it's more important that you pay attention. So Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. We must therefore pay attention, even more attention, to what we have heard <clears throat> so that we will not drift away. For if the message spoken through angels were legally binding and every transgression and disobedience received as a just punishment, how will we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? And in verse 4, I'm going to read from the message. It says, all while God was validating it with gifts through the Holy Spirit, with all sorts of signs and miracles as he saw fit. So my dear friends, pay attention to the science. Stay alert. All right. And another saying, and my sister's going to help me down here because I have to say it with conviction and with attitude. When you're soldiers, and you guys are soldiers, you've been incorporated into the army of God. Amen? All right. So you better pay attention like soldiers because I make the people do push-ups. Another thing we used to say to a soldier that really messed up royally, just did stupid things, you know, wasn't paying attention and just continually kept messing up. And I would have to come up to him and say, you better check yourself. Now, nah, she's going to help me. How would you say that? You better check yourself. Now, I want you all to say that with attitude, right? You got to turn your head a little bit and like you're talking down to them. All right, one, two, three. You better check yourself. All right. So, moving right along. I challenge you to remember three things. All right? I've already talked about a couple of them. Number one, pay attention to the signs. All right? Number two, stay alert. Okay, some of you already got shot. <clears throat> and the last one, you better check yourself daily. All right, let's move along. So, here are some of the signs that the Lord gave me, that he may be trying to show you. So one of the first ones is we begin to pull away from godly influences. And as a result, marriages suffer. Trust gets broken. We lose our hearts for others. We fall away from close relationship with other believers. And we neglect account accountability and connection with those who would encourage our walk with Christ. Now, Matthew 27, verse 37 through 40 says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Moving on down the list, some of the signs the Lord might be trying to show you is that we stop praying. Well, we become too busy, or we're weary, or sometimes we're just simply overwhelmed. Oh, yes, we shoot a few generic prayers up to the Lord. We wake up in the morning and say, Lord, please bless our day. And then we just run on out the door. But we're really unaffected by the lack of closeness we have with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There starts to become a distance. Many are constantly wired to electronics. And this is my pet peeve, those that know me. You act like your life cannot go on. You can't survive without electronics. We're more in tune to what others say and are doing constant media chatter than we are to what is on God's heart for the day. So, first correction for today is, if you're using electronic devices, I'm not going to tell you to put them away because you should be looking up Bible scriptures. But if you're doing something else besides looking up Bible scriptures, you're looking on the net, you're searching for stuff, you're chit-chatting with somebody else, you know what? That's a disrespect to the Holy Spirit. So I'm trying to teach you right here. When you come to church, you better come right, okay? Don't come play in church. There's nothing wrong with electronic devices if you use them in the right way. It's a tool the Lord has given you. Amen? 
That's enough lecture. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 and 18 says, Pray constantly and give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And we move on to the next one. Spiritual things that once concerned us, they no longer concern us. We're more easily influenced by the opinions of the world instead of the truth of God's word. Pay attention. Oh, I tricked you. I said, pay attention. <laughs> I didn't say stay alert. Good, good. You're catching on. Pay attention for your affections could pull your attentions elsewhere, back to the world. Your compassion for people has waned. His spirit within us is stifled or grieved. Have you ever grieved the Holy Spirit? It's not a good feeling. Our heart for God is dulled. The pull towards sin increases. We begin to see life through selfish motives, blurred by pride, and quest to live happy becomes on our own terms. We find ourselves twisting the truth to meet our own needs. We become numb to the danger that surrounds us until, unfortunately, it's too late. And you didn't avoid the great negative consequences that follow our choices. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16 says, Do not love the world or the things that belong to the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything that belongs to the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride in one's lifestyle is not from the Father, but from the world. 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4 says, For the time will come when people will turn aside, excuse me, time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine. They will turn away from hearing the truth and will turn aside to myths. The next one we're going to talk about is a complaining and a critical spirit. Have you ever been around people that complain all the time? You kind of shy away from them, right? So I call this critical spirit means you're not content or you're discontent. Beloved, in the end, a critical spirit is an indication of the condition of your heart. Scripture says in Jeremiah 17, verses 9 and 10, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can know it? The Lord searches the, and examines the mind to reward a man according to his conduct, according to what his deeds deserve. And in Luke chapter 6, verse 45, it says, For out of the abundance of the, the heart, his mouth speaks. And then also, But godliness with contentment is great gain. And that's found in 1 Timothy 6, 6. The next on our list that the Holy Spirit may be trying to get your attention to is doubting. You begin to doubt God. You begin to doubt His Word. You don't trust me or my Holy Word. In Numbers chapter 14, verse 11, the Lord said, How long will they not trust me or believe in me? Despite all the signs I have performed for them, will they never believe me after these signs? The next one is your priorities have become all wrong. They're out of alignment with the Word of God and His will. Listen, in the rush of modern life, it's easy for us to lose sight of our priorities. Under pressure, we make the mistake. We tend to focus on the urgent, but not the important. And when I was studying this, the Lord gave me two words at the end of this little statement. He said, are you proactive or are you reactive? And let me share a little insight. I was recently watching a TV special on 60 Minutes, and it was an interview with an expert from the Netherlands. And I found it very interesting because he was talking about, he goes around the whole world and helps other countries who have experienced these terrible floods or terrible storms, right? And so the Holy Spirit caught my attention. And as he began to speak, I can't tell you the whole thing, it would take too long. He says the USA uses FEMA. Everybody know what FEMA is, Right? When, you, when your roof gets tore up, we we'll wait about two years for your roof to get fixed. That's FEMA, right? So they are reactionary, right? They react after the storms. But this gentleman in Netherlands, he said that they learned from past experiences that in 1953, there was a terrible flood, devastation, and many people in their country were killed. So as a result, they, create, they corrected their priorities to prevention. They became proactive. So how are your priorities? Do you react? Do you wait for something terrible that happens and then you react? Or are you proactive, right? You start doing preemptively. 
What could you do preemptively? Anybody? You could read your Bible, right? You could pray. There's a lot of things you could do. So, next one on our list is self is on the throne instead of God. What happens is pride takes over. You say, I got this. No, no, no. I don't need any help. Right? So you try to fix it on your own. And then you say, no, no, no. It's not that I'm prideful. You know, I'm just independent. Right? But then pride becomes worse. Pride becomes so big, it becomes arrogance. And even Paul, the Apostle Paul, said in 1 Timothy that he was formerly a very arrogant man. The bottom line is this. It becomes you trying instead of trusting God. And instead of faith in God, you start having faith in self. Let's move along to the next one. Improper listening. That simply means you turn down the volume knob when the Holy Spirit is trying to talk to you. You refuse to listen. So you say, search your heart. Proverbs 28 and 9 says, If you refuse to obey what you have been taught or refuse to listen, your prayers will not be heard. Amen? Stay alert. I'm going to wake you up from time to time. Being judgmental too easily. Oh, you guys got quiet already. I know this is for you. So I'm going to read you a little story that illustrates. A man was complaining of his neighbors. He said, I never saw such a wretched set of people as are in this village. They are mean and greedy for gain, selfish and careless of the needs of others. Worst of all, they are forever speaking evil of one another. Sounds like some churches. Is it really so? An angel who had been walking along with him said. It is indeed, said the man. Why only look at this fellow coming towards us. I know his face, though I can scarcely remember his name. See his, his little shark-like eyes. They're cruel eyes darting back and forth, just like a ferret's. And the line of covetousness about his mouth. The very droop in his shoulders is mean and cringing. And he slinks along instead of walking. Oh, the angel says, it is very clever of you to see all of this. But there's one thing which you did not perceive, my friend. That it is a looking glass, a type of mirror we are approaching. And that's by Laura E. Richards. So when you start judging people, I hope you have a mirror in your back pocket. Amen. Next one is unforgiveness in your heart. Beloved, it's pretty simple. You need to free yourself. You need to let it go and give it to God. It must be replaced with kindness and forbearance. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14 says, Since God chose you to be holy people, He loves you. You must close yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, human, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowances for each other's faults and forgive anyone who has offended you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. And above all, close yourselves with love which binds us all together in perfect harmony. Amen? The next one on the list is you find your heart has become hard, cold, stone cold, distant, and withdrawn towards the things of God. Well, in my mind, the Holy Spirit said that equals rebellion. And if you remember the story in 1 Samuel and in Judges chapter 13, I want you to go back and read them later. And if you don't remember the notes, they're right there. You can come sign up for them later. Like Samson and Saul, it cost them everything. It cost them his blessing. Cost him his calling, his anointing, and eventually his very life. And that happened for both of them. Now, another one that the Holy Spirit brought to my attention is, you want to shift the blame or responsibility. So whenever something goes wrong, well, no, 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 it's not my fault. It's so and so. And you try to shift the blame to somebody else. And some of you even think you're slick and like, well, the devil made me do it. But the reality is, if we're honest with ourselves, 
We are our own worst enemies. Self, right? The flesh is your worst enemy. Moving along on the list. You are feeling bored, indifferent with your journey. You got yourself into a rut. Some of these I'm just going to go through quickly because we don't have time to go through every one with scriptures. Next one is you have become ungrateful, unfaithful. If you're not careful, you begin thinking that you're entitled. This is what we call feelings of entitlement mentality. And I can tell you it doesn't please the Lord one bit. Excuse me. Pay attention. If you're not careful, you may have gotten lazy. Oh, I just don't feel like it, you would say. But Romans 12, 11 says, never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord. Right? And we know another place in the Bible that says what? If you don't work, you don't eat. So listen, you better check yourself. Let me hear you. That is with your family doctor. Seriously, you better check yourself with the doctor. A lack of motivation could result from physical causes. So you might actually have a physical problem that you don't know about. Go to your doctor. Next we have no hope, feelings of hopelessness. And seriously, some people even get to the point that they have suicidal thoughts. How have others avoided despair? They trusted God's great promises. My friends, choose hope, not despair. Choose life, not death. Choose God's promises. God gives us unshakable hope. If... <clears throat> If you will only build your life on what 2 Peter 1 and 4 said, his very great and precious promises. Joshua 23 and 14 says, pay attention because I will soon die like everyone else. You know with all your heart and soul that not one single promise which the Lord our God has given you has ever failed to come true. Every single word has come true. Now remember, all Joshua's challenges didn't just disappear. He had to fight for seven more years to get to the promised land. And I like what Charles Stanley said in his book, and I've given you some information there if you're interested in the book. It's called Standing Strong. He said, no matter what your adversity may be, no matter what source it comes from, what truly matters is your attitudes towards it. What you believe and how you respond, how you take action, where you find your comfort and strength. Are you struggling with fear? 1 John 4, 18, and the message says, well-formed love banishes fear. 2 Timothy 1 and 7 says, God has not given us a spirit of fearfulness, but one of power and love and, and sound judgment. Then again in Proverbs 29, 25, the fear of man is a snare, but the one who trusts in the Lord is protected. We're almost at the end of the list, but I want to take and share with you a little story. And it has to do with your conscience. How's your conscience lately? My example is this, and I shared it with some people earlier this morning. They had a good laugh. The other day I went to Walmart, and I'll go through it quickly. I got to the register, and I was getting ready to pay, and I happened to look down, and I saw a $20 bill on the ground. I'm pausing for effect here. What's your conscience say? What would you have done? I know you're wondering what did Pastor Greg do. I picked up the $20 bill, right? Without hesitation, I gave it to the cashier, right? Figured I did the right thing. And as I began to walk away, my flesh began to rise up and remind me. I looked back and I saw the cashier. And I'm like, you know, she just kind of put that $20 bill to the side. She didn't really take any action with that. And, I, and my mind started to wander and the Holy Spirit stopped me right there. Stop. Don't you worry about what somebody else did or what somebody else does. You do the right thing. You did the right thing. Now you better step on. And you better stay alert. 
All right, they're finally getting it. Now, there are many more signs. We don't have time to go through all of them. Some of you are worried about the future. Some of you have excess stress of upcoming events. Some have lost your peace, anxiety, adultery, anger. Some are quarrelsome. Some have an attitude. Some are disrespectful. Some are bitterness, burnout, conflict, divorce, gambling, homosexuality, lust, pornography, prostitution, profanity, lack of self-control, sexual purity, substance abuse, emotional abuse, abuse towards your spouse and children. I'm supposed to just keep going on this list, but I'm going to stop here for a second. Listen, folks. If you find yourself being abusive towards your spouse, verbally, I hope it's not physically, you don't know what damage you're doing. When you talk harshly to your children all the time, screaming and yelling, slapping and carrying on, you will never know the damage you have done. Years down the road, those young ladies, those young girls turn out to be ladies, those young boys turn out to be men, and they will have a lot of issues they're dealing with. They will not trust. They will have fear. They will have difficulty with relationships that they get into. So you know what? It's up to you. It's up to you to knock it off. If you're doing it, you need to stop in the name of Jesus. Amen. Stay alert. You better check yourself and pay attention to the signs. You going to remember those three? All right, we'll see. Most of the hardships we go through are a result of us ignoring God's voice, warning us of how to avoid them. Amen? Now, I told you the what of the message, right? We talked about the signs that the Holy Spirit is trying to catch your attention with and trying to get you to correct yourself in the direction that you're heading. The next one is why. Why does all these things happen? Well, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said there's a disconnect with your relationship with the Holy Spirit and Jesus. Now, for some people, it's idols. And you say, wait a minute, wait a minute, that's Old Testament stuff, Pastor Greg. There's no idols anymore. Well, listen, the most simple definition I've found for idols is that something or someone has taken the place of Jesus Christ in your heart. Something has come between you and Jesus. That's an idol. So, now we come to the how. How do we fix it? Well, very simple. Five quick points. Go back and do the first things. That's number one. Revelation chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. So that's the first thing, right? Go back to the first things. The second one, go back and search your heart. Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24 says, Search me thoroughly, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there is any wicked or hurtful way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Also in 1 Kings, I was brushing up on the story of Elijah, and it came to a point the Lord had to correct Elijah, and he said, go and return by the way you came. You find yourself in a mess? Just go back where you came from. Start all over. Now, pray and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you the wrong turn, the wrong choice, or bad decision you have made. Perhaps it was a missed opportunity. Or maybe there was disobedience in your life. Perhaps you had a rebellious spirit. Or there's some sin. You need to search your heart about these things. Read read Psalm 51 when you go home. And look for the signs. Don't be lazy. Go back and look for these scriptures. Now, number three. True repentance. True repentance requires brokenness. And it requires that there must be godly sorrow. You see, you can't fool God with this fake repentance. God knows your heart. He knows if you're truly sorry. Psalm 51, verse 17b says, in the Amplified Version, The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, 
a broken and a contrite heart. That is, broken down with sorrow for sin and humbly and thoroughly penitent. Such, O God, you will not despise. And also in Psalm 51, verse 4, he says, Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So repent and turn from your sin. Listen, friends. It's not about you trying to clean yourself up. It's not about you trying to clean up your act to make yourself acceptable to God. You're wasting your time. That's not going to happen. There's nothing you can do to get right with God. Right? Because none of your works counts. It's not by works that you're saved. Right? It's by the grace of God. And we're going to get to how you can make those things right. Number four, you must turn from it. Turn from your sin. The Apostle Paul commended the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 through 10. He said, how you turn to God from idols and to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he has raised from the dead, and Jesus who rescues us from the coming wrath. Now, I'd like to share with you an illustration that I learned from Vernon McGee that will describe to you this turning away. Everybody take your hand, doesn't matter which hand, and look at the palm of your hand. That section of your hand represents sin. Now, you don't have to do this. I'm going to do it. I'm going to find a pen, and I'm going to write sin to remind me. You can wash it off before you leave the building. All right? So if that side means sin... Look, turn your hand and look at the back of your hand. That side represents Christ. So it's very simple. You have sin, the palm of your hand, you have Christ. So if you look to Christ, in order for you to look to Christ, you have to first automatically turn away from sin. Did you get that? Go home, look in the mirror, and do that a few times. Right? When you turn from sin... You turn to Christ. Or when you turn to Christ, you automatically turn away from sin. I, th I thought it was pretty cool. You may think I'm an old fart. That's okay. So, by turning away from something, that's true repentance. Psalm 119 and 59 said, I thought about my ways and turned my steps back to your decrees. The fifth one, restoration. Restoration. Jesus is willing to receive you back and restore the intimacy of your relationship with him. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how messed up you've become, right? The Lord loves you and he'll always receive you back. Revelations 3.20 says, listen, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and have dinner with him and he with me. Now, I'm giving you a lot of homework assignments and you'll only know those if you Look at the notes. You have to go back and review the parable of the prodigal son in Luke 15. And it basically says, While the son was a long way off, his father saw him and had compassion. He ran and he threw his arms around his neck and he kissed him. And let's celebrate we ha and let's have a feast because this son of mine was dead and now he's alive again. He was lost and now he's found. Now, beloved, very seriously, Coming to church is not going to save you. Going through the routines is not going to save you. The only thing that's going to save you is getting your heart, light, your heart right with Jesus Christ. And today you're going to have that opportunity. If you have never asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart and be your Lord and Savior and to forgive you of your sins, today is your day because we're going to have an altar call. There's going to be prayer councils down here, and I want you all to come down here and pray with them. And if you don't want to pray about that, you can pray about anything that you're concerned about. So, what's the three things? Pay attention to the signs. Stay alive. All right. And the last one? You better check yourself. Now, here's the funny thing about checking yourself. <laughs> the Lord told me, you know, that's real cute that you prepared that in the sermon. Right? He said, but when you, um, when you have checked yourself, you need to really make it effective by getting out a mirror 
and looking in that mirror and with that same attitude like you were looking down on somebody else, you look in the mirror and you say, say your name. Greg, you better check yourself. Sally, better check yourself. You get the point, right? All right, so before I finish up, I want to to share with you some admonition and some guidance that will help you along your way. Number one, inquire of the Lord before you proceed. If you remember the prophets of old, they always inquired from the Lord. And even the Apostle Paul, he was present, prevented by, by the Holy Spirit by speaking in Asia. He told him, I don't want you to go any further. And then if you remember the story in Acts chapter 16, Paul had a vision. You remember what happened in the vision? There was a man and he was crying out to him. He said, come over to Macedonia and help us. And Paul obeyed. And obedience is a big part of this message today. If you don't obey, you're going to find yourself in some of them bad situations. And Paul continued to evangelize all of Greece. And for me personally, being a Greek man, 100% Greek man, I am so honored and so humbled that Paul was obedient. And because of his obedience, many of my family members are saved. Number two, make better godly decisions. Proverbs eleven fourteen says, without guidance, people fall. My advice to you, seek the counsel of wise and mature, trustworthy believers, like Pastor, Pastor Teddy or some others. Be sure they're trustworthy. Don't you just listen to what somebody tells you. They might just tell you to go jump off a bridge. <laughs> All right, Proverbs 15, 30, 22 says, Plans fail when no counsel, with many advisors, they succeed. Now, the next one, moving along quickly, pay better attention to your choices. Proverbs 16 and 9 says, A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord determines his steps. Listen, my encouragement to you is follow your thinking all the way through to the consequences of your actions. If you would only think about where you're going to wind up and what the consequences are, I think that would be enough, enough deterrence for you to stick on the right path. The next one, listen for the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. You'd have to go back and review the story of Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19. If you remember, he ran from Jezebel. He was scared for his life. And do you remember the three things that happened to him in the mountain? There was a wind. You remember what the next one was? Where's my Bible scholars? There was an earthquake. Come on, guys, you should know this. There was wind, there was an earthquake, there was a fire, and he wasn't in any of those things. And finally, what happened? When did the Lord speak? It was a very quiet voice, right? Almost like a whisper. And that's how the Holy Spirit speaks to us. He's a perfect gentleman. He's going to catch your attention one way or another. Whether you listen, whether you obey, that's going to be up to you. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Remember, King Saul, it costed him not only his kingdom, but his very life. You can go back and read up on that in 1 Samuel chapter 15. 6 and 7 is pray for wisdom, guidance, and the leading of the Holy Spirit. And the last one, 7, get back to the basics. Christianity 101, right? So let's recap what we talked about so far. We talked about what are the signs the Holy Spirit might be trying to show you to get your attention. We talked about why there's a problem. There's a disconnect between you and the Holy Spirit and the Lord, right? We talked about how to fix it. That was repentance and seeking God's restoration. And now we're going to talk about when. Well, when is now? My last part. So now we come full circle. Number one, are you, con are you consistently in God's Word? Do you read your Bible? These are the basics of Christianity 101. Number two, are you praying regularly, consistently? Are you spending time at Jesus' feet? Number three, are you attending church faithfully and participating in the worship service? Now, I've got to stop for a moment and talk to you about the worship service. A quote I read said, oh, we sing words. We hear words, then we go home. Yet not really singing, not really hearing. We're unaffected, we're distant, and all the while our hearts are a million miles away. That's not true worship, my friends. That's the opposite of worship. Worship means not only just showing up on time, 
It means actively helping and serving with the needs of the church body. Let's get practical. Like helping with setup and breakdown. And I hope all those people back there yelling amen are going to be the ones up here helping, breaking down and setting up. But honestly, you need to stick around. Instead of running off, and this is just my personal conviction, so you could take it up with me. I feel like this. I was once told by an awesome man that his time is important to him. And that reflected to me. And so what I'm telling you is, at the end of the service, don't be in such a hurry to run off. Because whatever you have planned to do, to go eat, to go fellowship, whatever it is, your time is more important than my time. Your time is more important with the peop- than the people who stay here week after week, busting their back, putting stuff away. Shame on you if you run out the door. Now, you don't want to hear that preaching. That wasn't in my notes. But I feel the Holy Spirit wants you to hear that. Right? Don't be selfish. Your time's no more important than someone else's. Moving along. Volunteer just once a month. Jesus is our example. Right? Jesus came to serve, not to be served. And then also the Bible teaches to put others' interests and needs before your own. Philippians chapter 2. Now listen, that's the most, about as practical as you can get. How do you put the needs of others before your own? You sacrifice running out the door. You stick around and you help. You come and ask somebody, hey, what can I do to help? Because if everybody here helped, you'd be out of here in 15 minutes. And everybody could go eat together. All right. Number four, are you thinking correctly? Led by the Spirit of God in His Word. In his word, he says, seek what is above. Colossians chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Set your minds on what is above, not on what is on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with the Messiah or Christ in God. Beloved, we need the mind of Christ. Number five, cling to his precious promises. Memorize scripture. Speak scripture over your life. When the enemy comes at you with all kinds of problems and adversity, if you don't know the word, you're not going to have any ammunition to fight the enemy. John 14, 26 says in the message, the Holy Spirit will make everything plain to you. He will remind you of all the things I have told you. Number six, are you breaking bread, having fellowship with your other brothers and sisters in Christ? Listen, this is what the Holy Spirit was telling me as I was preparing this message. Do you call them? Do you check on them? Do you encourage them? Do you admonish them and edify them and pray for them during the week? Or do you just talk about them to somebody else? That's gossip. That's backbiting. So be honest. Be sincere. Actually show that you care. Let the love of Christ flow through you. You know that the predator always looks for the one who's singled out out of the safety of the fold. So isolation is dangerous. You know what a lot of Christians do? They back away from other people. They isolate themselves. And guess what? You make yourself a big target on your back for the enemy. Because now you have nobody to help you. It's a very foolish move. First Peter warns us, verse 5 through 8, your adversity prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Don't try to go it alone, beloved. You have friends here that love you and care for you. There is help. If you don't want to come to somebody here, talk to Jesus. Amen? Stay alert. You better check yourself, soldier. And you are all soldiers in the army of the Lord. Lastly is this. Number seven. Is love restored? Meaning, is the love of God flowing through your heart? See if these characteristics of love, and I'm going to go through it quickly, these good signs, see if they're acted out in your life as taught in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It says, love endures long and is patient and kind. Love never is envious nor boils over with jealousy, is not boastful or vainglorious, does not display itself haughtily. It is not conceited, arrogant, and inflated with pride. It is not rude or unmannerly and does not act unbecomingly. Love, God's love in us, does not insist on its own rights or its own way, for it is not self-seeking, it is not touchy or fretful or resentful, 
It takes no account of the evil done to it. That means it pays no attention to a suffered wrong. Verse 6, it does not rejoice at injustice and unrighteousness, but rejoices when right and truth prevail. Love bears up under everything, anything that comes. It is ever ready to believe the best of every person. Do you give people the benefit of the doubt? Its hopes are fadeless under all circumstances. It endures everything, that is, without weakening. Love never fails. It never fades out or becomes obsolete or comes to an end. The bottom line is this, my friends. Our lives ought to look different than the unsaved, the people that don't know Jesus. I see so many times lately, man, we look so much like the world. They probably say, why would I bother? I'm not going to go into some videos that I've seen. It's amazing. But let me share this before I finish up. Warren Wiersbe gave some words of encouragement and admonition and advice to the leaders. So the leaders, stay alert. I got a lot of leaders in here today. He said this, let's be among those who look to the future and enlist and train others to serve the Lord. Criticizing past failures accomplishes little. What's important is that we do our job in the present and equip and prepare others to continue it long after we are gone. Now, here's your takeaways. And Pastor Corey, you can make your way up. You better check yourself on a daily basis. All right? I don't hear what he said, but it must have been good. <coughs> Number one, am I paying attention to the signs the Holy Spirit may be trying to show me? Number two, is there a disconnect between my relationship with Jesus and his Holy Spirit? Number three, am I asking God to help restore my relationship and taking the necessary steps? Number four, will I remember the admonitions and guidance that I just gave you? And number five, will I get back to the basics? Christianity 101. So what are the basics? Anybody? All right. Am I consistently in God's Word? Am I studying and learning the Bible? Am I praying regularly, consistently? Am I spending time in His presence often? Am I attending church faithfully and participating in the worship service? Or am I lazy and am I selfish? Do I put the needs of others before my own? And I'm serious about this. If you think about it, it's Scripture. Put in the needs of others before your own. Your time is no more important than anyone else's. Stick around. We need help. Am I thinking correctly and being led by the Holy Spirit of God and His Word? Is the love of God flowing through my heart and my behaviors? Pay attention to the signs and take action. Now, before I say my last parting words, over here to my right, your left, there's a clipboard. If you're serious and you want a copy of my notes, I'll get them to you. There's also some handouts there, and there's also information of the books that I mentioned that I said that you should read. And there's also a discipleship plan. If you have gotten off track reading your Bible, there it is. There's a schedule for you. So for my parting last words, beloved, you don't have to live in those ways, meaning the ones, the list that we discussed at the very beginning, all those negative things. We can choose differently. It's not always easy because often, I would like the prayer counselors to come up at this time, because often it's easier to just go with the flow. It takes effort and hard work not to drift away. Feedy will agree. Once we began to drift away and that current was very strong, Man, it got crazy on the water. We were just in kayaks, you have to know. Right? I mean, she thought we were going to flip over. It got out of control. It gets scary. So we were painfully trying to fight the current that insisted on pulling and dragging us further into trouble. Honestly, it got a little scary. And life is the same. Folks, I know you'll agree. When you lose control... 
of your life. It's scary. If it's not scary, you better pray. It was very hard work for us to get back to where we started out. And the cost was horrible. We suffered for weeks to come from that experience. And if you could understand the spiritual undertones in this message, the Holy Spirit will bless you. I learned this lesson. The next time I try something, anything, I'm going to ask myself, is it worth it? <laughs> is it worth it? Before you get on that little crazy boat and you look at the rough water, you better ask yourself, is it worth it? Now, before I give you a couple of scriptures and we, and we leave, my friends, isn't it time you stop suffering? And I'm just going to speak my heart. Okay, the prayer councils are up here, right? All right, we're going to finish. And Pastor Corey, you can start playing, please. <laughs> 